What are your weaknesses? How would your co-workers describe you? What's 16% of 60,000? I'm starting to think you might not have the right experience for this job. Is there anything you can say to convince me otherwise? It happens. You're sat in the interview nervous about whether or not you're gonna make a good impression, and then bang, out of the blue, a tricky question is thrown at you. And under the pressure of it all, trying to scramble around for a suitable answer, leaves you like the proverbial rabbit in the headlights. So how can you prepare for these types of tricky questions so you don't reach this point in the interview? That's what we're gonna be talking about today. Hi, I'm Vicky Sherwood, author of the Biomed Ballast blog and host of the YouTube channel where we discuss all things career related for STEM professionals working in academia and beyond. What you're going to learn about today is how to answer those tough interview questions that can unnerve even the most confident of interviewees. Learning how to handle difficult questions is a key component to interviewing well. It's not always the top candidate who gets offered the job, but the one who interviews the best. Today I'm excited to invite Sam Barrett back to the channel. Sam's a former recruiter for the pharma industry turned career coach who previously came to talk to us about how to get hired in pharma. In that session, Sam mentioned that he helps his clients prepare for the interview process. I thought I'd invite Sam back to ask his advice on how to answer those tricky interview questions. So let's get started. No, th thanks a million for having me back. I really do appreciate it. Um, I, I, I love chatting about this stuff with both yourself and uh, your audience. One of the things that I found when working specifically with pharmaceutical candidates across the board, regardless of background, whether that be industry, academia or what have you, from grad all the way to the C-level um, exec, the ability to tackle open-ended questions was a bit problematic. I found that it was typically because there was a lack of structure, clearly path forward to answer those kind of questions and people tended to get lost in their answers. There is no right or wrong way of approaching these. They're just a, a better way and a not so good way. But you, you, you can't actually answer these questions incorrectly. So do take heart in that. So there's a, a four step process um, that I always say to my people whenever they're interviewing for these kind of questions. And uh, the first one is either agree or disagree with what being said. State your opinion. You agree with something or you don't agree with something. This serves one of two purposes. So the first purpose is your state and your opinion, which is always a good thing when asked about these more open-ended questions. But the second thing is it gives you about a second to have your brain think about what's being said and you don't just have to word bottom everything that comes out of your mind. So it gives you a split second to prepare. Take them through the next part of the process, which is setting the scene. The overall technique is called a SARS technique. So situation, action, and result. So after you've agreed or disagreed, you set the situation. So this is almost like you're setting the scene as if it was the start of a story. So you're setting the scene, you're explaining what's happening in said situation. So this may be a case of in academia, you might have a specific deadline for a research grant. You may have conflicting interests at the time. There may be other stuff going on in the background. You maybe have to give lectures. And so you have this conflict being built, you know, where you have to be able to manage your time. So this is what you're explaining to the interviewer. Next, and this is the probably the longest part of your answer will be the actual actions you have taken to solve that problem. This is where you really get into the nitty gritty of the details. You know, you go into the time and date of when you got things done, who you interacted with, what you went and did. For example, if you had um, if you had a research paper that was due, uh, you know, who were you interacting with? That, what did you actually set out to get done? And when when were things done? So once you've gone into the intricate detail and the more specific, the better, you then move on to what are called the results. So this is the culmination of all your efforts. So you've set the, so you've set the situation and then you've delivered on your actions. Now you want to move on to your results, the shortest part of your answer, but arguably the most important. So this is where you start explaining what were the consequences of what you've done, whether they be good or bad. Obviously, ideally, they would be in a positive situation. They, they resulted in a positive outcome. So, for example, in the scenario of uh, somebody who's looking to get a research grant or publish their, their research, you would have successfully attained that research grant or you have successfully published your paper or it's gone on to peer review or what have you. So that is a really brief introduction into that style technique. When you walk somebody through that, it not only 
makes it easier for you to answer those kind of questions. It's easier for who, somebody who's listening to you to follow your coherent thought process. And when you finish at the result, the interviewer should have a really good understanding of how you went about with your process and how that applies to them. Because at the end of the day, what you want to do is to implant in the interviewer's mind exactly how it is that you can benefit them through your competencies. There, there are a million and one different competency-based questions. You can't possibly prepare for them all. There are obviously mm. the usual ones like time management, organizational skills, you know, conflict management and team working skills. They're the main ones, but there's going to be off the wall ones that you just can't prepare for. Pick highlights in your career, you know, things that you're proud of personally. If you can lift between five and ten accomplishments in your career that you're particularly proud of, chances are they will touch on some elements of uh, what, what the interviewer is asking. And obviously mm -hmm. twist them around a little bit to fix into whatever narrative the interviewer is asking this question through. The more specific you can get, the better. Because at the end of the day, and this is quite important for interviews in general, you need to get to know yourself, to know how you interact in a professional setting. And think about how you yourself interact in these kind of situations in the past and hypothetically in the future. When you're in an interview, you'll be asked about these kind of things. And if you haven't thought about it, it'll be obvious. But if you've sat down and had some reasonably good introspection, it'll really help with your ability to answer these sorts of questions. One of the things that you really need to be aware of when you're dealing, especially if you're dealing with transitioning from academia to industry, is at the end of the day, industry is all about the you know bottom dollar. You know, it's all about making money. It's not necessarily about publications, you know, prestige or anything like that. It, they're private companies and businesses and they're there to make money. So what you need to think about is when you are talking about these different accomplishments, you know, you need to be able to translate them into quantifiable results. You know, they need to be able to translate into dollar signs, essentially. Um, you need to really be aware of the commercial value of what you're doing. When you're talking about the results part of your SARS technique, it's very important that you can frame it in that in that light. For example, what I would focus on if I were in academia would be definitely, you know, going out sourcing money for labs. You know, I know there are some people who are very heavily involved with that, that's quite commercially valuable, you know, somebody who's able to see the bigger picture. As somebody who maybe just finished their PhD or somebody who may be in a lab for a couple years, it is a little bit trickier. I think in that case, you need to focus on what you do in the lab and your awareness of how that can translate into the bigger picture. So just again taking another example documentation being able to understand that when all this documentation is done and it's done properly and there's no mistake that can then translate into a smooth process which again increases uh, the, the company's profits <laughs> no real easy way to answer these kind of questions um you know you you hear them from time to time you know what animal would you be and all this kind of thing mm -hmm. in stem i have found little of that most labs are quite no nonsense can you do the job or not having said that when i was working in it recruitment so working with software developers there was a little bit of that and you couldn't really prepare for them you kind of just had to roll with them so this again come back to what i was saying before about introspection if you're comfortable with yourself you can generally roll with those kind of questions personally I, when i was growing up i was the kind of kid who would be like oh what kind of animal am i googling that you know and that kind of thing so those kind of questions personally never bothered me the only way you can answer those kind of questions assuming they're appropriate of course kind of rolling with them you know take them with a pinch of salt because usually the actual answer is not that important it's more mm -hmm. about how you process information that thrown at you you know how do you think on your feet that's more important than the actual answer that you're given those kind of questions are, are are definitely designed to get your critical thinking, you know, get your creative thinking going as well. Especially if you're in industry, problems happen all the time and you just, sometimes you don't have protocol in front of you, you just have to be able to react quickly to what's going on around you and you have to be able to think on your feet and that's usually what those kind of questions are designed to do. was 
one question I was asked years ago where I was asked to ask an inappropriate question and they wanted me to see, you know, would I be comfortable pushing societal boundaries? Now, I'll not repeat the questions I said because it's hardly inappropriate, but uh, it, 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 that was probably my one question that I, that really threw me off. I was like, oh, mm. wow, I have to ask a question that's really uncomfortable to ask. Now, I've never heard of that since mm. and I would definitely not recommend any interviewers watching this to do a question <laughs> like that to your candidate. It can definitely potentially go into uh, d- dodgy waters. There are eight um, characteristics that are protected by international law. I'm not going to remember them all off the top of my head, but I'll just say a few of them. So age, sex, religion, sexual orientation, uh, marital status, and there's three more. Just stuff you're usually born with or be personal choices such as your faith or your, your marriage. So people can't really ask you about those things. If you volunteer the information, that's different. If people do ask you about these, age usually being the most common one. It depends again on what kind of life that it's at. Usually it's a more of an inconsiderate way rather than malicious way. They're not really thinking about the potential implications that it could have on you. Maybe it could be a case of you mentioned it was your 40th birthday. Oh, you had your 40th. You know, what did you celebrate? and all this kind of stuff and it can maybe veer in that kind of direction or sometimes it can be a bit more direct saying you know this is quite a physical demand physically demanding job are you sure you're young enough to do this something quite blazing like that and you can understand sometimes why people go in that direction however just because you can understand it doesn't mean that it's appropriate now to answer those kind of questions it very much depends on the person who's being asked those questions some people are perfectly comfortable just saying yeah you know this is what it is etc if you're not comfortable you have to be competent enough to say sorry i'm not going to answer that question what i would say to you is if somebody is interviewing you who probably only met you for the first time and asking these inappropriate questions uh, that's a a really good indicator of what kind of culture that company has and would you really want to work in a company that thinks it's okay to discriminate on those kind of bases those are the kind of questions you need to think about before going for any interview and then if you're unfortunate enough that these kind of questions do crop up you don't have that rabbit in a, in a, in a headlight kind of moment your response is swift and ready to go Usually what I say to people is make it about the interviewer. One of my personal favorites is what do you like about working here? What what are you passionate about? When people ask it, they usually get surprising answers back and they find that uh, it either makes or breaks the whole interview for them. Usually makes it for them rather than breaks. If you kind of get a more human side of the interviewer, especially if you're dealing with who could potentially be your line manager, you get a really good insight to what what they value. I was doing some interview panel work sitting in. I was helping a client uh, do some interviews with candidates. I did some interview prep with some of those candidates and I said, what I would recommend is just ask what you like about working there. And they really liked what they heard, you know, when I got went back and got feedback from the candidates. That is definitely one question I would always ask. Another thing, if you want something maybe a little bit more aggressive, if I'm offered the job, what do I need to do to succeed in my first month, three months, and six months? Planting that in the interviewer's head, you know, oh, okay, you know, this, 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 this person's serious about this. Well, you need to do X, you need to do, you need to do Y, you need to do Z, and then go forward from there. What these questions at the end of the interview are designed to do is not only to get the interviewer to open up, open up a little bit but they usually add more tidbits of information that you wouldn't ordinarily get they may say for example in six months time we have a conference that comes up annually you would be an important part of that and they say oh tell me more about the conference and then it goes on from there so you usually find out little bits of information that way good question to finish off on is has there been anything that I said that you want me to further clarify so it gives them the option to say oh you you mentioned this tell me more about that or it's like nope that's it so that just kind of helps close up the interview and just kind of gives it a nice clean break sam that was brilliant thank you so much for those insights i'm sure people will find them really useful when they go for interviews so really appreciate it thank you Sam provided some really helpful advice there on how to answer some challenging interview questions, which I'm sure will help you improve your interview technique in what is currently a tough job market. So let's just recap on a few of the things we've learned. 
Number one, the situation action result technique can help you answer open-ended, competency-based questions. Framing your answers in this way provides a structure that's easy to follow for the interviewer. Prepare for these questions by picking five to 10 career accomplishments that you'd like to highlight and do some introspective preparation. Number two, think about the bigger picture when mitigating a lack of commercial sector experience. Explain your research work in a way that resonates with private sector hiring managers. Perhaps you've optimized processes in the lab, saving time and or money, or you've contributed significantly to projects that have secured considerable funding, or perhaps you've helped build productive collaborations. Highlight such accomplishments in both your application and an interview, and this will help you secure a job in the private sector. Number three, show you can take the heat by thinking on your feet when answering wildcard questions. Oddball questions are deliberately placed to throw you off balance. They're used to test your ability to think creatively under pressure, compose a logical answer, but there's no need to take the answer too seriously. The key is to not let the interviewer see that you're easily rattled. Number four, be confident in declining to answer inappropriate questions. Some inappropriate questions that are actually unlawful, particularly if they're asking for deeply personal information around protected characteristics. You're within your rights to politely say, I don't feel like I have to answer that question, and then try to bring the focus of the conversation back onto the job offer itself. Remember that organisations that insist on asking such inappropriate questions might not be such a good place to work. Finally, ask the interviewer questions to help you learn more about the role and make you look good. A professional interviewer will give you the opportunity to ask questions, which usually happens towards the end of the interview. Ask things that provide you with useful information and that show your interest in the company and the job. Things like, what do you enjoy about working here? Or what would you expect from me in the first three, six or 12 months in the role? A good closing question to ask is, is there anything you'd like me to clarify about what we've discussed? And that's it. This will help you prepare to answer difficult questions so that you're not left floundering in interviews. And if you've got any questions of yourself, please leave them in the comments below. And likewise, let us know if you've used this advice in your next interview and how you got on. Best of luck for those interviews. If you've enjoyed this content, and you want to learn more about some of the things you can do to help you secure a job after your current academic position while still positively affecting your research work, then head over to my site. I've got a free download that can help you with this and offers some great suggestions for you to prepare for a job in industry after your current academic position. Mm -hmm.